All right, we're in Revelation chapter 3. If you'd like to open up there, please. And we're going to pick up here in verse 14. I'm just going to read these eight verses or so, and we'll get right into the teaching this morning. Revelation 3, 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So every time Jesus has given a uh, dictated letter to each of these seven churches, he concludes it with that statement. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So these letters were not just written for these people at this time in 95 AD, obviously. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's speaking to all the churches and all the Christians uh, throughout all generations of church history. As we've studied up to this point, uh, each of the six letters to the six churches prior to uh, Laodicea, we could see there is personal application. There's things we could learn. There's things we could learn what to do, what not to do from all of these letters. So although Jesus was speaking specifically to a small group of believers there in 95 AD uh, in the area of Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, uh, it's much bigger than that. Uh, As we have been uh, studying through this uh, succession of prophetic chronology related to the past 2,000 years of church history, only the Lord Jesus Christ knows the end from the beginning. I encourage you, go back and listen to the first six messages if you were not here, because each of the letters builds upon another period or time, a period of time on the timeline of church history for the last 2,000 years. In Isaiah chapter 41, uh, the prophet Isaiah uh, says this, the Lord really uh, Uh, speaking here, Isaiah 41, 4 says this, speaking about prophecy, who has performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last, I am he. So God asked the question, who has performed it, and done it, calling the generations from the beginning. Only the Lord knows the future, right? Only the Lord can accurately predict the future 100% of the time. It's been said that up to 30%, at least 25% of the Bible, but upwards of 30% of the Bible is prophecy. When it was written, it was prophetic. It was something that hadn't yet happened. Uh, And so Bible prophecy is one of the greatest evidences that the Bible is an inspired book because no man, no men, no women could predict the future with 100% accuracy hundreds of years or thousands of years in advance. But that's what we see the Bible do over and over again. And God asks the question, who is like me? Who could declare the end from the beginning? And the answer is there is no one like the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 21, we read this. Present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. 
let them show the former things what they were that we may consider them and know the latter end of them or declare to us things to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter that we may know that you are God's. Yes, do good or do evil that we may be dismayed and see it together. Verse 26, who has declared from the beginning that we may know and former times that we may say he is righteous. Surely there is no one who shows. There is no one who declares. Surely there is no one who hears your words. So the Lord is saying if it, the gods of the nations, the gods that Israel was worshiping and Judah was worshiping, the false gods, he was saying, let's, let's bring our gods together and let's have a, let's have a, uh, you know, uh, a contest here. You guys try and predict the future. You're the Little statues, your little idols, Baal and Ashtoreth and Molech and all the rest. See if they can predict the future. They cannot. God says, I will declare the end from the beginning, uh, demonstrating that God is the only true God. He's the only one that knows the future with 100% accuracy. And then in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 18, we read this. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Verse 20 of Isaiah 45 Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, you who have escaped from the nations. They have no knowledge who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no other God besides me. A just God and a Savior there is none besides me. So the Lord just lays down the gauntlet to the false gods and says, if you're a God, tell us the future. Tell us what's going to happen 100 years from now, 50 years from now, 500 years from now, 1,000 years from now. The reality is, is nobody could do it. Muhammad never attempted to predict the future. Buddha never attempted to predict the future. Uh, anyone who has ever attempted in a religious environment, a religious setting uh, to predict the future has been proven wrong. Look at the Jehovah's Witnesses. How many times they've tried to predict the second coming of Christ. Uh, look at those false prophets uh, on the internet who tell you that, you know, 2012 and this date, December 21st, 2012, the Mayan calendar says it's going to be the end of the world and they get everybody scared. Or there's four blood moons in September in 2015 and so it's the end of the world and everybody's scared. Or the dragon and the virgin and the stars speaking uh, astronomically about this date in September 21st of whatever year it was, 2018. This is the end of the world. I mean, every single time somebody tries to make a prediction, especially about the rapture of the church or the second coming of Christ, they're proven wrong every single time. Uh, no one knows the future except for God. God shows the future to his prophets. He shows the future to those uh, who were to write it down, preserve it for us, for the future generations. And so this is something that, you know, even Nostradamus, people say, well, what about Nostradamus? Have you ever read Nostradamus's predictions? They're so weird and esoteric and mystical. You could make them say anything you want them to say. I mean, even the, the, the most devoted scholars and the most devoted fans of Nostradamus, uh, the, the, the French uh, supposed prognosticator there uh, in the 14th or 15th century AD in Europe, uh, that he would go through weird things and do magic potions and magic spells and looking mirrors and looking, you know, water and, and, and different things that he would put in there uh, to open up the spiritual realm. Uh, he was only right about three or four percent of the time out of his hundred percent of his prophecies. Only three or four percent of them could even vaguely have been fulfilled. And that's if you're giving him, you know, a lot of grace. So the reality is, is God says, I declare the end from the beginning. And this is how you know that a prophecy is from God if it comes to pass. And the Bible is filled with prophecy. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 29, as he was preparing his disciples to go and die and, and be buried and, and crucified and then uh, to, to, to rise again and be resurrected on the third day, Jesus said this in John 14, 29, and now I have told you before it 
comes, before it happens, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. So Bible prophecy is a great apologetic, or in the Greek, the apologia, the argument for the Christian faith being true. There's no other holy book, there's no other holy person in history that has accurately predicted the future with 100% accuracy, not even close. If you study the religious writings of the history of the world, they don't even try to predict the future because it just goes off into uh, nonsense. But Jesus says, this is, 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 is what's going to happen, and when it happens, now you know that what I'm telling you is the truth. What does that mean? What's the takeaway? The takeaway is that we could believe our Bibles, that the Bible that could predict the future thousands of years in advance with 100% accuracy can be trusted in everything. If God, who knows the end from the beginning, could tell us what's going to happen in the last days, written 2,700 years before Christ or 3,000 years uh, or 2,700 years ago, uh, 1,000 years before the birth of Christ, 700 years before the birth of Christ, and all of these prophecies have been fulfilled at his first coming, and then there's a whole bunch more that need to be fulfilled at his second coming, you could trust God for the rest of the word. If, if he knows the future and he's telling us the future, then we could trust that his word is true. So these seven churches that Jesus dictated these seven letters to were not just written to those people uh, of, of that generation in the first century A.D. Uh, Jesus was speaking prophetically of the timeline of chronology of church history. There are seven different dispensations of church history. You could go read. I have the volumes of church history written by some of the greatest scholars of church history, and there's 12 or 14 volumes of books on church history. And you can't get away from the fact that Jesus laid out a perfect chronology of the different eras of church history, basically uh, hundreds and thousands of years before they came to pass. The first church was the church of Ephesus, you remember. That was the apostolic period representing the chronology or the epoch of time from A.D. 30 or 30 A.D. through approximately 100 A.D. And this was the uh, church of the apostles where the apostles were still alive, still writing the New Testament and so forth. And Jesus uh, basically told them uh, they were doing really, really well, but they had uh, left their first love. They were starting to just go through the motions of uh, a plain church. Smyrna uh, was the next church. This was the persecuted church. This was the church from AD 100 through approximately 312 AD when Constantine, Emperor Constantine, came to power and Christianized the Roman Empire. Uh, Smyrna, nothing bad to say about Smyrna. Jesus only had encouraging things, no correction, no rebuke, no condemnation, and they were persecuted terribly. This was the period of time where they were feeding Christians to the lions, literally feeding them to the lions, crucifying them and burning them alive. This is what was happening at this time in addition to other horrible, terrible ways of torturing and killing Christians just because they would not deny Christ. The third church is the church of Pergamum. Pergamum means married or elevated. This would represent the church period from 312 AD through approximately 606 AD. This is the period of time when the Roman Empire was Christianized, when all of the temples to the false gods were converted to churches, where all of the false gods' names were changed to the names of the saints. And instead of praying to the gods, you now started to pray to the saints. Instead of going to worship the false god in the temple, it was turned into a cathedral. They put a uh, cross on the top of it. Uh, and and you see the merger, the blending of church and state, the marrying of church and state. It's been said the church of Smyrna, where Satan was trying to destroy the church and killing millions and millions of Christians through persecution, Satan realized he couldn't kill the church. He couldn't stop the church through persecution because the church just exploded exponentially. The more the church was persecuted, the faster it grew. So instead of trying to destroy the church, Satan changed his tactics and he joined the church. And he realized if Satan gets into the church, then he could have the power to destroy the church from within. And that's what began to happen uh, during that period of time in 312 AD when Emperor Constantine basically declared the entire Roman Empire as Christianized. The next church is the church of Thyatira. This is the church of the dark ages from 606 AD all the way through until the present time. This church of Thyatira is the corrupt church. This is the church during the period of time of the dark ages. This is the time where kings and popes came to power and killed uh, and devoured with the sword in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus told Peter, put away your 
Put away your sword, Peter, uh, for he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. But during this period of time, the church took up the sword. You had the crusaders. You had the Roman Inquisition. You had the Spanish Inquisition. You had the, 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 the church going all over the road world, whether it was the Anglican church where the king of England was the head, or whether it was the Spanish church with uh, Ferdinand and Isabel, uh, the king and queen uh, uh, of Spain who were answering to the pope. You had kings and, and you had popes and you had everybody hungry for power. And what they did is they went and they uh, said they were uh, missionaries, sending missionaries all over the world. But what they were actually doing is going to conquer nations and indigenous peoples to steal their gold, to steal their silver, to kill them by the edge of the sword, to rape their women. I mean, it's sad. It's tragic because this is the church history. This is the reality of what the church did during this time. Uh, popes were corrupt. Kings were corrupt. Churches were corrupt. Pastors were corrupt. It was a period of total corruption. This is the dark ages, the church of Thyatira. The next church is the church of Sardis. The church of Sardis would have been the age of enlightenment from 1520 AD up until the present time, starting with Martin Luther in the time of the Reformation in Europe. And it started off really, really well, but it, it died very, very quickly. Uh, you had first the enlightenment and you had the reformation of the church. You had the Protestant churches coming out of the Catholic church during this time, which was a good thing. You have the Bible being printed during this time into languages that people could read for themselves. That was a good thing. Uh, Tyndale and Wycliffe and all the others, John Huss. And then, and then all of a sudden you have the church just become a state institution and it becomes this thing where if you're uh, a, a resident or, or, or you live in a certain country, all of a sudden you're baptized as a baby, you're saved, they say, as a baby by baptism, uh, and you are a member of the church, the state church, let's say the Lutheran Church of Germany or what have you. And so this church became a dead church very, very quickly. Again, the Lutherans, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, they all started off very, very well, the Episcopalians. But overwhelmingly, as we're going to see here today, these churches are dead churches to this, to this day, even as Jesus predicted that they would be. Remember, Jesus dictated these things to John, the beloved disciple, in 95 AD. So everything Jesus was saying was prophetic, that things that were going to come. The sixth church uh, that Jesus dictated the letter to was the church of Philadelphia. This was the faithful little church of the last days. This started in approximately 1750 AD uh, during the, um, the uh, Great Awakening. There was a Great Awakening in Europe that took place, and then it came across the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. We had a Great Awakening here with Jonathan Edwards and the others. Uh, and, and you had all of these great missions programs that came out of this period of time. There were more missionaries sent out, true missionaries, not with a sword to take people's gold and rape their women, but missionaries going to reach uh, the lost indigenous peoples in the jungles, the dark jungles of the world, to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Hudson Taylor and William Carey and David Livingstone and all of the rest uh, went out all over the world with the gospel message during this period of time. It's probably the most prolific propagation of the gospel in the history of the world from 1750 until the present day. This is the church of Philadelphia. Jesus had nothing negative to say about this church. This is where the modern missionary movement came from. But there's also another church in the last days, and this is the lukewarm church. So you really have four churches, according to this chronology, four churches that are still in place today. You have the Thyatira Church, which is the Roman Catholic Church, the corrupt church. You have the Sardis Church, which is the Protestant Reformation Churches, which is the dead church. You have Philadelphia, which is the modern missionary movement church, the uh, Great Awakening Church, the church that sent missionaries out all over the world that has kept his word and not denied his name. Uh, and, and that is still around today. I would pray that we're that church, the Church of Philadelphia in the last days. And then you have, fourthly, the Church of the Laodiceans, which is the false church. This is the apostate church. This is beyond compromising. This church is completely lukewarm. Warm. They don't think there's anything wrong with anything that they do. This church period began in approximately the year 1900 when the World Council of Churches was founded and the idea of modern ecumenicalism began. There is a push to make a one world religion. And this church of Laodicea is the Christian quote unquote branch 
of that one world religion, the compromising church that wants to go along uh, just to get along, compromising with the world, compromising with sin, not wanting to offend, not wanting to teach the word of God, not wanting to preach the gospel, not wanting to tell people that they're sinners, that they need to be saved by being born again, not talking about the cross of Jesus Christ uh, because it's offensive, because the cross is where you deserve to be and I deserve to be. So don't talk about the cross. They don't talk about sin. That's offensive. They don't talk about the blood because blood is gory, they say, and blood is gross, and so they don't want to talk about the blood of Jesus Christ. No, the blood of Jesus Christ is what washes us white as snow from our sins. We have to preach the cross. We have to preach the atoning work uh, of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, his propitiation for our sins. We have to preach that there's an only one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There's not two ways to God. There's not a hundred ways to God. There's not every road leads to the top of the mountain. No, there's one way. There's one name given under heaven by which men must be saved, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. You see, this church doesn't want to preach that in the last days. And this is what makes up the overwhelming majority of the churches, I believe, in America, in Western Europe, and really uh, now uh, spreading throughout the world, this compromising, apostate, lukewarm, false church, the Laodicean church uh, here in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Notice here what Jesus says to them. He says, I know your works, in verse 15 of Revelation 3, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Very, very severe thing for Jesus to say, especially when you consider that if you're in Christ, you're in the body of Christ, and he's talking about expelling you out of his body. That's a vomiting that's like throwing you up. And so you don't want to be that church. You don't want to be that guy. Uh, Jesus is warning them. Uh, Jesus is disgusted with this church. He's got nothing good to say about them. He found something good to say about every other church, even if it was just a little thing. He has nothing good to say to this last day's bloated, enlarged, compromising, lukewarm church. He has nothing good to say. He basically tells them, you are lukewarm. It's the idea of like taking a drink. You know, if you have a drink uh, of, of hot coffee, uh, or hot tea. Uh, that's good if you want a hot coffee or hot tea. Or if it's a hot day, you want a cold coffee, an iced coffee. I like nitro cold brews from Starbucks personally. Uh, pretty, a lot of caffeine, pretty strong. But cold coffee is good too if you like coffee, or iced tea is good. But what happens when you have lukewarm coffee? You don't want to drink it. You, don't, you either want to heat it up or you want to put it in the fridge, or lukewarm tea or lukewarm soda. I mean, you you don't want to drink something that's lukewarm. Like Jesus is saying, I want to take a sip of you and vomit you, spit you out of my mouth, vomit you out of my body because, you know, you're not hot or cold. It's also like the idea of being comfortable. It's like being in a comfortable, perfectly uh, uh, temperatured swimming pool where it's just 80 degrees all the time and it's just comfortable. You're not hot, you're not cold, it's just right. Kind of the Goldilocks idea. Or you go to the Caribbean Ocean and go in the waters in Hawaii or in the Caribbean uh, and the waters are warm. It's comfortable. You're just comfortable uh, in your lukewarmness. And Jesus is warning this church. He's telling them, uh, because you're lukewarm, you're neither cold nor hot. I will vomit you out of my mouth. So this is certainly the church that we do not want to be associated with in the last days. As I've done uh, with these other uh, studies, I'm going to read to you, again, for the sake of time, I'm just going to read to you uh, directly from this commentary, one of many commentaries uh, I'm reading to put these sermons together. This is from Tim LaHaye, the author of the Left Behind series, uh, written uh, way back when, I think in the, in the 1960s he wrote this. And this is what he says about this church, the church of Laodicea. Tim LaHaye says this on page 60 of his commentary, the uh, Revelation Illustrated. The last of the seven churches is the most disappointing, he says. In fact, it is disgusting. Our Lord compares it to the nauseating experience of drinking anything lukewarm. In this sense, it is a graphic prophecy of the modern-day apostate church. Laodicea was a wealthy inland city about 40 miles from Ephesus. Steeped in Greek culture and learning, it was a thriving center, it was a thriving center of industry. 
The local church must have been wealthy as evidenced by the fact that many present-day ruins, uh, that among many present-day ruins are three churches dating back to the early days of Christianity. In spite of her wealth, nothing is known of the ministry of this church in preaching the gospel throughout the region around, uh, around it, as was characterized by the church of Ephesus. He continues, it should be kept in mind that the first three church ages differ from the last four in that each of the former stopped at the beginning of the next church. Ephesus was replaced by Smyrna, Smyrna by Pergamum, Pergamum by Thyatira. Um, A look at the chart at the beginning of part one will show that we have Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia with us until the present time. Those last four churches are still here today. Thus, Laodicea adds to this church age by arising from the three that preceded it. The Laodicean church age began around 1900 and is increasing in intensity at a breathtaking pace. Laodicea could well be called the apostate ecumenical church that is gathering momentum at this very hour. The characteristics of the Laodicean church age can best be seen by a detailed examination of Christ's condemnation upon her. Uh, Skipping to page 62, the church of Laodicea has the distinction of being the only whose conduct was so reprehensible that even the Christ of glory who knew all about her could not find one thing upon which to commend her. This is a tragic indictment indeed on so-called Christianity in this 20th century, because he was writing this uh, in the 20th century. I could say the same today. It's worse now than when Tim LaHaye wrote this. Uh, And so this would be, we believe, the Protestant arm of the whore of Babylon. The whore of Babylon that we're going to look at as we get into the book of Revelation is the Antichrist religious system where the false prophet and the Antichrist require everyone to worship the devil, to worship the dragon. This would be the Protestant wing, the evangelical Protestant wing of that group of people. You're also going to have uh, those from the Roman Catholic Church. You're also going to have those from the Russian Orthodox Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, uh, the dead churches uh, uh, of Sardis, the Lutherans and the Methodists and so forth. Those who are not Uh, truly born again, who are not truly saved, who are just playing church, who are just doing religion, uh, and uh, who are trying to actually uh, assemble all all Christianity together into one religion uh, and one one, uh, faith of of Christianity with the Pope as the head, actually. Uh, That's what they're driving for, these ecumenicalists. And then they want to tie them into all the other world's religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and so forth, and basically say, we're all worshiping the same God. And then lo and behold, guess who the God is that shows up? It's Satan. That's who the God is that uh, the whore of Babylon is going to be worshiping. So, uh, you know, the the Bible tells us that that, um, basically... being being in a place of of, of being comfortable is not the greatest place for us as Christians. You live any amount of time as a Christian, you know that. We often grow lazy. We grow weak spiritually when we're comfortable, when everything's kind of going our way, when we don't really need God. We can show up to church on Sunday morning, maybe Wednesday night, but the rest of the time we're fine. We don't need God. We've got it. We're, We're comfortable. Everything is going our way. And the Bible uh, doesn't have a lot of good to say about living a comfortable life. As a matter of fact, it's been said that God comforts the afflicted, but God afflicts the comfortable. So think about that. Uh, God comforts the afflicted. When you're broken, when you're downtrodden, when you're afflicted, God is right there to comfort you. He's right there with you. But when you're comfortable, you don't need God. You kind of keep him at arm's length, don't you? That's what we do when we're comfortable. We're apathetic. We're kind of lazy. Uh, and so sometimes God has to stir us up and God has to kind of, you know, uh, poke us a little bit in order to wake us up again. So God afflicts the comfortable, but he comforts the afflicted. God is far more concerned with our holiness than he is with our happiness. You have to remember that. God's not so concerned with you being happy. God's concerned with you being holy. He wants us to be like himself. He says, be holy for I am holy. This generation, the Laodiceans, they just tell you how great you are, how wonderful you are, and how much God loves you. That's all true. But you're also a wretched sinner that is dead in your trespasses and sins if you're not born again by the Spirit of God. That's true too. And the problem is the church has become one where they're entertaining the goats rather than feeding 
the sheep. The majority of these big churches are filled with unsaved people because they've never been told how to be saved. Matter of fact, if you told them they were sinners and they needed to be washed by the blood of Jesus, half the church would probably walk out and not come back the next Sunday. That's why they don't preach these challenging messages in many of these large churches. I'm not saying that every large church is a Laodicean church or a lukewarm church, but I would say the overwhelming majority of the larger churches are lukewarm churches. God promises uh, to, in his word to meet our needs, uh, not to give us everything that we want. And that is the problem with our generation. Our generation uh, is just demanding and naming and claiming that God just give us everything we want. Otherwise, I'm not going to come to church anymore. And that's the opposite. We're to serve him. He's the king. We're not to order him around and boss him around. He doesn't have to obey us. We must obey him. In Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, God uh, brings this charge against the nation of Israel. He says this, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me because you have forgotten the law of your God. I also will forget your children. My people are destroyed for lack of of knowledge. Why? Because they don't want God's law anymore. They didn't want his word anymore. And that's the problem. When the churches stop teaching the word of God, they grow apostate. That's what happens. It's a second law of thermodynamics. Everything's going to its disorganized and chaotic state. In Hosea chapter 8 and verse 7, God says this about them. He says, they sow to the wind and they reap the whirlwind. The stock has no bud it shall never produce meal, and if it should produce, aliens would swallow it up. So this is what God says they're doing. They're sowing their seed to the wind, and they're going to reap the whirlwind. Why? Because they're not continuing in knowledge. They're not continuing in the law of the Lord. And this is the danger with the last day's church. In 2 Timothy in chapter 3 and verse 7, we read this about the last days. These are going to be those who are always learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Doesn't that describe our generation? Everybody knows a, lot, a little about everything, but they don't know much about anything, right? Everyone's an expert, right? Everyone knows a little bit about everything, so they think, but no one knows much about anything. Uh, and so this is the generation that we're living in always learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then in Psalm 78 and verse 5, we're told that it is the job, it's very appropriate that we are doing a, a child dedication today, it is the job of the Christians, it is the job of the people of God to raise their children in the ways of the Lord, to pass that torch, that baton on to the next generation. Psalm chapter 78 and verse, verse 5 for he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. Passing the baton, passing the torch on to the next generation. It's been said the church is always one generation from being a dead church. And all you have to do is look at the churches throughout history. Look at all the empty cathedrals throughout Europe to show you that that is true. We're always one generation away from the church being completely empty. We always have to reach that next generation. Verse 6 says of Psalm 78, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. So we have to teach the next generation. We have to feed the sheep. We have to teach the parents and teach the grandparents and teach the adults so that you have the tools. You're equipped so then you could teach your children and your grandchildren and pass this on to the next generation. I have a couple of articles here I want to try and get to quickly uh, from the Prophecy News Watch site. Uh, this is an article titled, Christian parents are failing to instill a biblical worldview in the next generation. This is what this article says. I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs. Surveys show that Christian identity is in decline in America. A study conducted by the Family Research Council suggests that only 6% of the adult population has an authentic biblical worldview. 
Do you feel like you're all alone at your your job and in your community and in your neighborhood following Christ? Only 6% of the adult population in America has an authentic biblical worldview. So how can believers more effectively spread the gospel and begin to reverse the trend? Sociologist and researcher George Barna has the answer. It starts with children and how they are raised. Essentially, what's happening is we've developed a kind of new modeling of parenting, which I describe as outsourcing, Barna noted. We look for people who can do the best job in different dimensions of our children's lives. And so we'll look for the best teachers, the best coaches, all of these kind of people who we can hire or cajole into spending a lot of time with our kids to give them whatever kind of training and development and experiences that they may need. But what's happened as a result of that outsourcing model is that parents have stepped back and they've handed over the worldview development process to all of these outsourced experts, the professionals, the one who allegedly have better experiences, better processes than we do. What we discovered, Barna continued, is that most parents have no plan for what they're going to do to raise their children up. Less than 10% of them have any kind of a spiritual development plan for their children, and that includes worldview development. And when you look at the parents themselves, what we know is that only 2% of parents in America today actually have a biblical worldview. You can't give what you do not have. This is George Barna, one of the greatest pollsters that there is, of Barna, the Barna polls. And um, only 2% of parents in America have a biblical worldview. So if you're a parent, you have a great commission, you have a great job, and that is to reach your children with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's one of the reasons why the last day's church is apostate and the last day's church uh, is so uh, lukewarm and so ignorant, actually, of the things of God and especially of uh, the Bible and of the Word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 uh, and verse 1, we're told that the last days is going to be defined by false prophets, false teachers, and deception in the church. The church is going to be defined not by holiness and righteousness and uh, missionary evangelistic work. The last days church uh, is the compromising church. It's the selfish church, the church that only cares about itself. And there's false pastors, false prophets, false teachers that are filling the pulpits of these churches to deceive the people. Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 says this, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Verse 3 of 2 Timothy 4, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. That's what we have in the pulpits of the churches throughout America and throughout many parts of the world today. Uh, People that are just getting their ears tickled. What does that mean? It means the preachers are telling the people what they want to hear instead of telling them the truth. And, you know, I, I have a tendency to, to, to offend people sometimes when I teach the Bible. I sometimes step on people's toes. But I am going to have to answer to God someday for what I told you from this pulpit. And God forbid if I'm going to lie to you and not tell you the truth, because I'm going to have to answer for that someday. I want to be able to stand before God and God pat me on the back and say, well done. You, you, you gave him the truth. You gave him my word. Whether anybody wanted to hear it, listened to it, appreciated it, whether they hated it, disliked it, it's okay because my, my, my boss is God. I have to answer to him. I have to check in with him for, for what I'm teaching. And so I, I don't mean to offend. I, I'm not a controversial person that's always wanted to argue with everybody and fight with everybody. That's not who I am. Uh, but I'm not going to compromise what the Bible says, even if it challenges, even if it makes us uncomfortable, uh, even if it uh, perhaps convicts you uh, in a way that you're not accustomed to uh, in church. 
In 1 Timothy chapter 4, we read this about the great apostasy, which is a great falling away, not a great revival in the last days. There's no great revival predicted uh, in the last days except during the tribulation period, actually, with the tribulation saints. But leading up to the tribulation period, what is predicted is a great apostasia, which is a great departure from the faith, a leaving of the true faith. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in the latter days, the last days... 1 Timothy 4.1, some will depart from the faith. That's the Greek word apostasia, from which we get apostasy. Giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. So what's going to happen in the last days? Many are going to depart from the true faith because they're going to begin to listen to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons in the church. In the church he's talking about. You can't depart from something where you're not. These are people departing somewhere where they have been. They're leaving the truth and going after the lies. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared as with a hot iron. Apostasy, deception is what's predicted in the church in the last days. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3, as Jesus was there at the Mount of Olives with his disciples. And we're going to look at all of this. Don't worry. We're going to get to all the prophecy that I know you're excited about in the book of Revelation. you are like, let's get through the church age and get to the future. Let's get to the rapture and the tribulation period. Let's see what's going to happen to this world. The millennial reign of God. Don't worry. We'll get there. We'll even get to the new heavens and the new earth at the end. But for now, we have to, we have to see where we're at. In Matthew 24 and verse 3, Jesus said this, They came to him as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, and his disciples asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? His disciples wanted to know, when are you coming back to rule and reign over this earth as king? Jesus answered and said to them, Matthew 24, 4, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. The first indicator Jesus gave that you're living in the last days, of the birth pangs of the last days, is tremendous deception in the church, tremendous deception in the world. And I think we are probably the most deceived generation of human beings in all of human history. I firmly believe that because of the power uh, and the multiplied power, uh, exponentially multiplied power of social media and of the, uh, of the internet. Lies just race all over the world before people even have a chance to check it out to see if what they're saying is true or what they're reading uh, is true or what they're watching is true. So there's going to be deception in the last days. He says in verse 11 of Matthew 24, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. False prophets. These are people speaking on behalf of God, supposedly prophets of God, but they're deceitful, uh, deceitful prophets. They're false prophets. They're lying to the people. In 2 Thessalonians, in chapter 2, Paul the Apostle tells us uh, about this and, and warns us about this. 2 Thessalonians, in chapter 2, in verse 3, Paul says this, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of the, uh, of the return of the Lord, will not come unless the falling away comes first, the apostasia, the man of sin is re revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So there's going to be a great falling away first. There's going to be a tremendous deception. The Antichrist is going to rise up. Of course, this is speaking of the abomination of desolation, which we'll get to later, where he declares that he's God, the Antichrist, and demands to be worshipped as God. Verse 9 says, the coming of the lawless one, speaking of the Antichrist, this is 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned, who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. These are the ones who don't want the word of God. These are the ones who don't want Jesus Christ as king. 
Just like the Jews said, we will not have this man to rule over us. We're not going to have him as king. They said, well, then what should we do with him? They said, crucify him, crucify him. They said, we have no other king but Caesar. Uh, It's the same idea here. When people reject the truth, they will believe the lie. If you reject the truth, you're going to be open to be deceived. That's why it's so important that we stick with the word of God, that we study the word of God, that we test the spirits according to the word of God. Test all things and hold fast to that which is true. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 3, I think this is probably one of the greatest indictments that we are living uh, in this last day's generation. Let me read this to you. This is a list of what the generation of people is going to look like in the last days. 2 Timothy 3.1. You just read this and listen and see if this defines us today, our generation today. I think it does. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Treacherous, dangerous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away." So the Holy Spirit showed Paul what the last day's generation, what generation is this? This is the generation that's going to worship the devil. This is the generation that's going to take the mark of the beast, full well knowing that they are following Satan to his end all the way to the lake of fire and hell. This is that generation. This is what they look like. This is what defines them. They're lovers of themselves. They're lovers of money. They're boastful, proud. They're blasphemers. They're disobedient to their parents. They're unthankful. They're unholy. They're unloving. They're unforgiving. They're slanderers. They're without self-control. They're brutal. They're despisers of good. They're traitors. They're headstrong. They're haughty. They're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. This This defines our generation today, guys. This does not define any other generation in human history besides ours. Maybe pockets, but not the whole world. The whole world is like this now. And so I believe that we are living uh, in the very uh, last of the last days. In this day and age, the church is so easily influenced by the culture. We have moral relativity. We have amorality in the church where no one takes a stand for morality anymore. We have disobedience to authority at all levels. Uh, People are loveless and they're selfish. They love themselves. They don't love others and they certainly don't love God. And it's a very dangerous generation. Jesus says to them in verse 17 of Revelation 3, because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and, do, and, and have need of nothing. This is what they say. They say, I'm rich. I'm wealthy. I have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Jesus' assessment is not the assessment of the culture. I'm okay. You're okay. Let's just leave each other alone and everybody's doing what they want. That's Satanism. Satanism is do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. It's the first law of the Satanic Bible in the Satanic Temple. Do what you want. Is the, is the law of Satanism. It's not the law of God. The law of God is you shall love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength and love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's not about me. It's about God and it's about others. Satan comes in and says, no, it's not about God. It's not about others. It's about me, myself, and I. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Jesus uh, uh, measures this church and they come found, they're, they're found wanting. They uh, come up light on the scales and God is going to judge them. He tells them, uh, be zealous and repent. It's interesting that Jesus is writing this to Christians. He's writing this to churches or to a church. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. 
Jesus is commanding his church to repent to these so-called Christians. Now, you could debate whether or not these people are really ever saved or were they saved or whatever. They think they're Christians. They're going to church. They're sitting in churches on Sunday morning, some of the biggest churches in the country, in the world. They think they're saved. They think they're fine. And yet Jesus says, you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. The way Jesus sees them, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind and naked. And what's the remedy? What's the solution? Repent, be zealous, therefore, and repent and turn to the Lord. The Bible tells us it's better to obey God uh, than to obey man. It's, uh, you know, the fear of man brings a snare and, and let God be true and every man a liar. So we have to decide, are we going to take a stand for the Lord in this culture? Are we going to take a stand against abortion uh, as Christians because we believe Psalm 139, that we are knit together in the womb, that we are created by God in the womb. And so every child from conception is created in the image of God. Uh, are, are we going to stand up against the LGBTQ uh, uh, you know, tsunami that's come into our culture, that's come into our schools, that's come into the government, that's even come into many churches? Are we going to oppose this? Not because we're hateful or because we don't like people, but because we love God more than we want to please people. And the Bible tells us uh, that these things are wrong. These things are sinful. God just doesn't pick on the lesbians and gays and bisexuals and transgenders. God picks on those who are committing adultery, those who are committing fornication, those who are living together in sin, those who are looking at pornography, those who lie cheat, steal, uh, those who covet what someone else has, those who rebel against their parents, those who have other gods and other idols, those who get drunk, those who get stoned, those who get high on drugs. God's not just picking those who practice prostitution. God's just not picking on the LGBTQ. It's just that the LGBTQ has come in uh, again like a tsunami into our culture, and we are not just uh, ex ex expected to tolerate them. We are expected to embrace these lifestyles. But God's word doesn't give us the permission to embrace sin in the pulpit or in the congregation. We have to stand for what is true, guys, in this last day's generation. The church has to become strengthened. We have to be tempered. And we have to be strong in these last days that we will not bend to the whims and to the winds of the culture and, and, and the seas of change throughout our culture. Because, uh, again, let God be true and every man a liar. It's better to obey God than man, regardless the cost, regardless if they banish us from Facebook, they put us in Facebook jail for the sermon or YouTube jail for this sermon, as they often do for my sermons. Or they come in and they threaten to find us, or they come in and threaten us with hate speech, or they come in and threaten to arrest me. We're not going to stop preaching the word of God in this church, guys. This is, this is, this is what we're doing. Jesus' answer is this. In verse 20, he says, Behold, after he says, Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the idea that Jesus is outside of this church knocking on the church door. What a sad testimony to this church. He's not even inside the church building. He's outside the church. They've kicked Jesus out of his own church. Jesus is on the outside knocking on the door and saying, you know, open the door. If you open the door, I'll come in. There was a, a painting painted of this picture of Jesus. And many of you know it. Jesus is there. He says, I stand at the door and knock. And there's no door handle on the outside of the door. The door handle is presumed to be on the inside, the latch. Whoever opens the door to Jesus, he comes in. He doesn't force himself into anyone's life. He is a gentleman. But his soft, still voice woos sinners to salvation by calling them to repentance, by calling them uh, to deny themselves, take up their cross and follow Jesus, by calling them to be born again and to be filled with the Holy Spirit uh, so that their names are written in the Lamb's book of life and they've crossed over from death unto eternal life. And Jesus says, and this could be applied to us individually, the door of our hearts, I stand at the door and knock. 
And so I encourage you this morning, if perhaps today uh, you have walked away from the Lord and you need to come back, or perhaps you've never been born again, uh, you've never uh, uh, prayed and asked God to forgive you of your sins and, and to save you, uh, perhaps today might be the day for you to, to do just that. If you feel convicted, the Bible says, if today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Again, God is a gentleman. He doesn't force himself on us. He knocks. We have to open the door from the inside, the door of our hearts to allow Jesus Christ to come in so that we're no longer sitting on the throne of our hearts. Jesus is the king who sits on the throne of our hearts. He's the boss. He's in charge. We're his servants. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. One more verse as we close here. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 says this, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Verse 13 of Romans 10, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, Let all men everywhere repent, Uh, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 17. If you've never been born again, I encourage you, let today be the day that you give your life to Christ. If you've wandered and you've gone off into the world like the prodigal son and you've been rolling around in the pig pen with the pigs in the mire, as it were, and God's calling you home, let today be the day you you come home to the Lord. And we're going to have prayer teams up here in the front. We're not going to make a big show of it. We're going to invite you to come up and pray. If you want prayer today, if you want to pray for salvation, or you want to rededicate your life to Christ, uh, today I would encourage you, if today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you tell us the end from the beginning. We thank you that you declare the future to us, to prove to us who you are, that you exist outside of the space-time continuum, and every prediction you've ever made, God, has come true, or it is still yet to happen. We thank you, Lord God, that you even gave us the order and the chronology of the eras of church history so perfectly as they line up here in these seven letters to the seven churches. Lord, we desire that we would be that church of Philadelphia, Lord, that we studied on Wednesday night, that faithful little church that has kept your word and not denied your name, Lord, that you will keep us from the hour of trial and testing that is to come upon this whole world. And Father, for any who are here, Lord, perhaps they're convicted by this message. Perhaps they're living a lifestyle that's not pleasing to you, Lord. Perhaps they're lukewarm and apathetic uh, in their walk with you, Lord. And today they want to get right with you. I pray, Lord, that you would, uh, even just in their seats right now, Lord, by your spirit, that you would convict many and draw many to yourself. Bless us, Father. Bless our church. Bless our families. Bless the children, the parents, the grandparents. Bless our leaders, Father God, and our servants. Bless the finances of this church, Lord. We ask you to continue to bless this church abundantly, Lord, for we are here for you, Jesus. It's all for your glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.